Good morning, everyone. My name is Alison Watson, and I will be your moderator today for our uh, session on effective pharma communication, um, a critical component of achieving IPM. This is part two of a four-part series held over six months. We were really trying to dig down into how we can better communicate to farmers and drive change. So welcome to this uh, exciting part two. We had an excellent part one about a month ago, uh, where we shared lots of great information to move to our next slide and really emphasize that we have an extremely busy agenda today. Um, we have five expert speakers from across the world and within our region, uh, and we'll be hearing about social networks, connecting with farmers through the use of video and multimedia, digital applications, connecting with farmers through radio, and then we'll be finalizing our session with looking at hybrid approaches to farmer communication. So extremely busy, and you'll see some of our speakers uh, on the side panel there that uh, lit up there in, 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 uh, in the side uh, videos. Um, just before we start, I just want to really reiterate that a recording of the webinar will be made and be distributed one week after the session. Okay, so don't worry, you will be able to get to see all the presentations again. If you have any technical issues, probably the best idea is to try logging off and on and seeing if you can resolve it or send a message to Grow Asia in the chat uh, and we may be able to help you. Two, the best way to interact today is to use the Q&A box to ask all your questions to the speakers. Uh, this is really important because it helps us to um, manage the session really efficiently. Um, so please use it. But if you'd like to uh, make a comment, uh, share some resource, uh, congratulate one of our excellent speakers, please use the chat box for that. Uh, and we really welcome you introducing yourself in the chat box too, so we know who you are. Um, if you have the chance, you can rename yourself by just clicking the more button um, next to your name, and you can put your name and organisation if possible. So just to reiterate, it's a four-part series. We looked at behaviour in session one. Session two is communication channels. Session three will be around pesticide use and behaviour communication. Then we'll be looking at best practice. Uh, and we also would like to welcome you to send all your case studies and examples to our email address at faw.growasia.org. Um, we really um, would like to have a conversation about this with you, so please join our Farmer Communication Forum. And if you want a certificate of participation, you must subscribe to the Farmer Communication Forum and either ask a question, share something interesting about farmer communications, um, or note something you found useful in the workshop. And to join that forum, all you need to do is go to our website at asianfawaction.org, uh, press community, go into forum, and then you'll see actually a lovely little picture there around farmer communication. Click on that and you can start talking and communicating uh, with colleagues across the region. Okay, in our first session, we're very lucky to actually have examples of communication and TV series and poster campaigns shared. Dr. Hong actually shared some from Vietnam, which were very effective. We also had uh, examples of communication from farmer field schools, school education campaigns um, that were shared by a speaker from Indonesia, Andy, Dr. Andy Trisiano. Uh, and our project assistant uh, um, has also been um, looking at what are some of the ways that this region is sharing information around integrated pest management and fall armyworm. And so um, Putra has uh, actually brought together some resources around what governments are doing on websites uh, with fact sheets, PDFs, um, using the use of Facebook, WhatsApp and Telegram by government institutions, but also other groups. Uh, and WhatsApp and Facebook are very popular in this region. Uh, and also YouTube seems to be a very well-liked way to share information here. So actually some of the ministries are using it, um, but also some of the private sector groups as well and organisations such as the Indonesian Entomology Society. So that brings us on to our first speaker today, Dr. Ariel Benishai. Uh, from William and Mary University, and he's also, I think, the, the head of head econ, economist at Aid Data. So, welcome, Ariana. Really um, pleased to have you join us, and I'm really excited about what you're going to share around the use of social learning as a policy tool through social networks. So, I'll just ask you to share your presentation, and thank you. Sounds great. Thank you so awesome. much, Alison. I think. Uh... 
pop it up here for us as well. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for the chance to speak with you all. This is a really exciting topic uh, and one that I've been working quite a bit on. Uh, also with my colleague here, Mushfik Mubarak from Yale University. A lot of this work that I'm gonna talk to you about is joint work with Mushfik and, and others. Um, so part of what I wanna mention is that social learning or social diffusion um, is something that's actually quite common. Many of you have probably seen it in practice, uh, whether it's you know, people immediately around you chatting and you know, neighbors talking with one another, family members. And as academics, you know, we've documented this in a whole variety of different contexts, whether it's pineapple growers in Ghana, maize farmers throughout sub-Saharan Africa, rice farming in Bangladesh and India, you know, even in, here in the US, uh, learning among corn farmers in the US Midwest. Uh, these conversations happening, again, among neighbors, uh, in churches, in a variety of settings. Um, and we've also documented this kind of social learning in lots of non-agricultural settings, you know, people learning from each other across the board in many important sectors. You know, when we talk about this often, what we have in mind is a general form of communication, but it's really helpful to think about what it is that we're actually learning. In many cases, what we're learning is the benefits of a particular technique like IPM where you know, it has a particular set of impacts and gains that we can have. And so what we observe is, hey, our neighbor is doing really well, or a friend of mine has had a boom season this year, right? This is because they've, they've done this new thing. We're also learning about how to do the thing, right? The methods of actually implementing these techniques. So watching the practices that are being put in place, learning the details of a particular practice. And many of our studies that we'll talk to you about, we were studying pit planting. So, so planting in pits rather than in ridges for, for maize in Sub-Saharan Africa and learning how far away apart to, to make these pits, how deep to dig them, uh, how many seeds to put in them and how much fertilizer to add. These are all the kind of details that we're often learning from, from one another as farmers. Uh, and then of course, we're also learning about how hard it is to do the practices, right? And what the costs are. There's uh, financial costs, additional outlays for new inputs or new techniques, technologies. Um, and what some of the downside risks are as well. So, you know, are these uh, techniques potentially exposing farmers to more uh, downside risk? Much of this we can observe, so just by watching our neighbors, friends, and family members, but a lot of this we can't, uh, and we actually have to communicate with them. So to some extent, what we, what we see in the uh, wider world is a set of mimicry, right, where we copy the things that other people are doing. But some cases, we actually see a lot more communication and what I'll call kind of deeper understanding of the practices. And, you know, the extent to which you want to promote that deeper understanding is, of course, you know, it's tougher to get, but, but uh, obviously, you know, much more beneficial. Uh, another set of things, you know, that we think about around this kind of learning by doing is, is that learning by doing is really partially about watching people who are actually putting the practice into action and we're watching them do it. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from people even who haven't tried things out themselves, but have certainly just heard about a new idea, right? And just kind of raising awareness more generally. And all of these types of communication have a different role to play potentially in the spread of important information. But we have a big puzzle. Uh, this. Uh, you know, puzzle, uh, like I, I bang my head against it uh, many nights. So if social learning is so prevalent, right? And, and as I've just described to you, we've documented it in lots of contexts, lots of different types of agriculture and beyond. Why don't we see more technologies and behaviors that are promoted by agricultural extension offices around the world catching on more quickly, right? Why isn't it like wildfire spreading in every case, right? And, and this is you know, the, the puzzle that uh, I'm, I'm trying to answer these days. Um, partly, I think it's because social learning and you know, using these kind of social networks for the diffusion is really about enlisting volunteers, right? It's, it's about trying to get farmers who themselves might not be rewarded for communicating to do so anyway, right? To communicate voluntarily. 
Um, and this can work. There are settings where this can happen, especially when the volunteers are intrinsically motivated, right? They really believe in spreading the word. And when they benefit a lot, right? So they really believe in the technology. But in lots of cases, that's hard to find, right? People who have really gained tremendously themselves and are willing to spread the word voluntarily, those people are, are kind of rare uh, in, in much of the world. And so, you know, we really might have to go beyond just enlisting volunteers and offer incentives and rewards for this kind of diffusion or dissemination. So what kind of rewards can we offer? Um, you know, Mushfik and I uh, have, have experimented with this uh, in Malawi, you know, where we uh, offer performance-based in-kind rewards to farmers uh, based on how much information they spread. Again, you know, pit planting was one example where farmers um, taught other farmers about how to dig the pits and how far apart and how deep to dig them. Um, and so part of what we rewarded them for was how well other farmers in their villages performed on tests that we gave them about pit planting. And then we also offer rewards for the actual take up of the practice and long term adoption, both by the farmers who are the communicators by the handful that we pick in every village, let's say to spread the word and by others in the, in the village. So try to reward people, not just for teaching others, but also encouraging them and kind of promoting this on a long-term basis. And then finally, you might offer performance-based incentives, not just for even trying it out, but actually for doing it well, right? For taking the practice up and really paying attention to the details and generating better outcomes. So getting better yields or, you know, seeing better nutrition application of, uh, of inputs, et cetera. Um, so these are all kind of different ways to think about how you might reward communicator farmers, right? Farmers who you hope are diffusing or disseminating this information. And which of these to incentivize really depends on how variable the benefits of the technique that you're promoting is. And of course, how much time it takes for it to take root, if you will. Um, again, as I mentioned, in, in our Malawi case, we incentivize the in spread of information in the first season and then adoption among other farmers in one's village in the second season. Those are the things we rewarded farmers for, and, and we saw a really strong response to those incentives. I should say we also saw a really strong response, in, uh, particularly in cases where the farmers who were doing the communicating were some of the least well-off farmers. So these incentives might work really well for encouraging more marginalized communities or, or individuals who might otherwise not have the social status or means to diffuse or spread information, right? They're not used to acting as teachers. They might not be necessarily the most powerful or respected individuals in a village, and yet they might be the ones who can respond to these incentives the most. This actually segues into another question, which is if we want to maximize the amount of social learning that uh, farmers do, right, the amount of communication and learning that happens in villages among farmers themselves, maybe we should target agricultural extension slightly differently from the start. Most extension, at least that I've uh, seen around the world, is based on a mix of agents and farmers doing this communicating. But the farmers that the agents tend to work with are what we think about as lead farmers, right? And they're more willing to experiment. They tend to be better educated, maybe kind of a little bit more well-off or, or slightly more progressive. Um, but these farmers, these lead farmers might not be the most relevant to other farmers learning. That is, if the amount of skill they have or the assets they have, access to supporting labor or other kind of complementarities, um, if these are important, then the returns to the technology or techniques that they're promoting might also vary across the population. And therefore, people might learn more from others who are more similar to them rather than the lead farmers that an extension agent might pick to work with. And in fact, those who are similar to the largest number of other individuals in their village, that is people who are more representative, might actually be the best communicators out there because their learning and their experiences are more relevant to other villagers and farmers. And again, in an experiment in, in Malawi, this is what Mushfik and I found, that the farmers, when we pick the farmers who are 
much more similar to other farmers, much more representative, the adoption of the practices among the other farmers in their villages, especially when they, these communicators received rewards for promoting this, was much higher than if a lead farmer was assigned and communicating. Uh, but of course, these individuals who are more representative and much more similar to their peers also face barriers to getting the training and trying out new techniques um, themselves and might find communicating with other farmers harder. And so again, the role of incentives for communication might be even stronger if we're trying to promote kind of more representative or peer farming methods. Mushrik and I put a lot of details of this in, in some of our academic papers. Um, it's also really important to think about the levels at which we want to approach this. Um, whether we're kind of picking a few individuals within a village to promote this, or whether we might want to pick clusters of individuals or entire villages to be promoting this. And whether we take one or the other approach really depends on how much complementarity there is among these initial kind of trainees or initial communicating farmers. A couple of things to think about there, right? So how important is it for a farmer to hear about the techniques from multiple sources? If it's really important, as we'll talk about in just a minute here, uh, then it might be crucial for you to target clusters or entire villages because a single training farmer uh, in a village might just not be able to convince enough other individuals. It also is important whether the trainees uh, and communicating farmers need to work together. Um, if this is a case where, uh, you know, a technique is particularly challenging and they need the support of one another to do so, again, you might want to think about doing entire villages or clusters of individuals in villages together at the same time. Uh, and then one of the last things I want to tell you about is another experiment that we conducted, again in Malawi, with similar techniques, where what we really tried to understand was very much this kind of question about how important is it for you to hear about a new technique, not just from one source, but from multiple sources before you are kind of willing to believe the information and try out the new technique. Uh, and so in this particular case, we uh, did a really careful measurement of social networks in 200 villages in Malawi. Uh, and when we took all that data that we collected on these social networks and used it to predict who the best initial trainees might be uh, in different villages. And we predicted this in some villages based on uh, a simple learning approach where you just need to hear about something from one other person, one contact. And then in other villages uh, based on a more complex approach where maybe you need to hear about it from two or more sources of information before you're willing to try it out. And using these different approaches, we picked different farmers to train in different villages. Uh, and what we found is that selecting based on this kind of more complex approach, again, trying to assume that people need to hear about a new technique from multiple sources of information, this performed at least slightly the other methods that we used, including the more simple version of learning and it outperformed extension agents just working as they otherwise would and picking farmers to train as they otherwise would. So there definitely is a benefit to thinking about this kind of spread of information as a more complex system where multiple uh, individuals should be trained, but maybe they should be trained together and picked from a part of a village where they're much more likely to interact with the same individuals. And so pass along kind of complementary, right? Or reinforcing messages to farmers so that they're getting these messages from multiple potentially trusted sources and thus willing to try it out and take it up. And then we used all the data we collected to try to then understand how the farmers themselves were actually learning in the first place. And partly what we found is that you know, about 50-50 uh, of the population, like 50% was using a much more simple version of learning, where as long as they heard about this new technique from one person, that was good enough. But about half of the population was using a more kind of complex version of learning where they were really a little bit more hesitant and really needed to hear about from these multiple sources. And 
that meant that a more complex approach to things was much more powerful because it was the only way to reach these individuals who, who you know really needed to hear about things from multiple sources, kind of much more hesitant to begin with. Um, lastly, the very last thing I'll just mention, we also did a really careful study trying to understand the role of gender in all of this and whether the farmers who are doing the communicating, you know, when they are uh, were assigned to be women or assigned to be men, uh, what their respective impacts were. Um, and a lot of what we found is that the women trainees, especially in this case in Malawi, where we were training them on pit planting, they learned a lot, they were very capable, um, but they were perceived as less knowledgeable than men. And thus they had to exert a lot more effort to overcome this perception and achieve comparable adoption levels in their villages. And this extra effort comes at a real cost. Um, so overcoming these kind of gender barriers is still a very prime, uh, you know, concern in these kind of social network based adoptions. Uh, you know, the, the social networks here were really biased against uh, women, even though, again, they were learning about the techniques and putting them to action, um, you know, even better than the men in many cases. I've got a lot of questions for, you know, future research things that we're tackling. Um, but at this point, you know, I'll just uh, be interested in hearing your questions right, much more than the questions I've got. Let me stop sharing my screen. Excellent, thank you so much, um, Ariel. That was um, very, very interesting. And there's lots of um, work there and also um, valuable insight to sort of think about um, going forward. I actually really like your questions at the end. And just to remind everyone, um, that you'll be you'll have a copy of the you'll have a copy of the PDF of the presentation and also the recording. So you'll have a chance to go back and look at some of uh, the questions and some of the work that's that's been put forward this morning. Uh, I, I've got a few questions here. Uh, and just remind everyone, please put your questions and answer your questions sorry in the QA panel. Um, here's one from Siva. Interesting example from Malawi about incentives and adoption. Was the adoption sustained as the seasons progressed? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it, it turned out that it generally was, although you know our studies only lasted for a few seasons. But you know the longest one, you know, took uh, about three years out, um, and it looked like you know the the adoption was sustained. We, we saw very little kind of disadoption in the later years um, that was, you know, in any way kind of correlated with the kinds of things we were studying. Um, but we've yet to do a really long-term study on a lot of this. Um, I think it would be, yeah, it's certainly something we've talked a lot about. Great. And, and just on that, I mean, how important is it to sort of uh, factor in reinforcement sort of, I guess, uh, opportunities across not not just the length of the project but sort of even to factor in extending those reinforcement opportunities beyond that time period how important is that sort of reinforcement messaging yeah you know i i personally think it's it's really crucial and again i think it's it's really important to for that communication to come from multiple channels um, that are reinforcing one another um, but you know we we don't have a ton of experimental evidence on that yet I think it's it's really you know that that's a that's again something we've talked a lot about. If if we were able to offer um, these same farmers again another set of kind of reinforcing messages, what's the best way to do that? Um, is it again to go with their neighbors and friends, or or should we now try to to use extension agents, but with different techniques? Thought a lot about those things. Now you mentioned also gender inclusive approaches, or just that that need to factor in that that gender element. Um, and you said it required additional effort to overcome perceptions that, for example, women might be less knowledgeable, but it comes at additional cost. So just kind of what what is that additional cost? And, and then how important is it to design a gender inclusive approach from the very start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's really essential. You know, in our case, we actually uh, specified that you know, for our experiment, half of the villages would have the farmers be a set at having a majority women communicators there. Um, and in the cases where we did not specify that, virtually none of the communicators selected were women. So it was really essential for us to set that benchmark. Um, and then 
the, you know, to, to the project and to us, uh, there was not additional cost of training necessarily the women, but the women themselves faced a lot of additional effort costs. These women tended to have to do more trainings of their neighbors, and they reported having to do more, to exert more effort to communicate the, the messages to their neighbors. Um, so it's, you know, if you're going to try to rely on these kind of social networks to do this, you might be transferring and imposing a lot of costs on the women farmers. Again, all the more reason to think about incentives and rewards for the mm. farmers who are doing the communicating on, on behalf of the project, right? Uh, it might be particularly important for the women farmers to be receiving a set of rewards that's appropriate to them um, if they are to have to overcome these barriers to meet the, to meet the kind of targets that you're hoping for. Excellent, thank you. Very interesting. Um, here's a question from Dr. Andy Trisciano, uh, one of our speakers in our last session. Uh, thank you. And he says, in regard with selecting the target, which one is more effective by selecting one representative from each farmer group to end up with 20 participants compared to 20 participants coming from the whole farmer group? Yeah, that's a really great question. Again, I think it's really specific to like the technique that you're trying to, to train them on or, or the approach. If you think it's important um, for the communicating farmers to be working with one another, then you know I think trying to, to, to train more of them in the same group is essential. Um, I think you know trying to train one person in a group on a technique and hoping they spread it, that I think is very low odds because again, as we saw even in these cases, you know, in Malawi, most people needed to hear about something from multiple sources. So picking at least a few individuals from each group to, to work with and train is I think really essential for nearly any technique. But again, the more the technique requires kind of complementarity and, and you know, cooperation, the more that you wanna be working with larger numbers within the same social group or the same business group or farmer group or whatever that, that kind of grouping that you're doing. Excellent. Um, very, very useful, multiple sources needed. Um, here's a question from Dr. Mooney. Um, often agricultural input suppliers, agrovets, for example, are the ones that farmers reach out to for information and recommendations. Have you included them in your studies? Uh, the, yeah, that's another great question. Um, you know, I, I've just come across a new study by, by other uh, colleagues at another university that have uh, just relied on them, and they had a lot of success doing this um, exact thing. Uh, I believe it was in, in northern India, um, where they were relying on the seed suppliers in this case to uh, promote a, a new, uh, more flood tolerant variety of, of, uh, of uh, seeds. So it's it's a really you know important new channel uh, that you know so far I've only seen one study on it. It was a very promising study. I agree. These are typically pretty trusted sources of information. Yeah. At least for for those farmers who are able to access uh, those private uh, suppliers or, or private sources of of um, inputs. Yeah, excellent. Uh, here's a question just back to the gender. Um, it's a really interesting question. Can you please? quickly <laughs> expand and clarify the types of motivations and rewards um, between male and female farmers. Do they differ, for example? So do you have to give different rewards or different incentives for the females versus the male farmers? I think that's a, yeah, that's an excellent question. Obviously that really specific to the context and the culture that you're working with. Um, you know, in our case, the rewards included both uh, inputs. So we tended to give like legume or bean seeds, um, or in some cases, fertilizer to uh, the farmers. But we also included a social component. Um, so farmers were recognized at, at a ceremony at, held at the village and kind of honored for their work, along with the rest of the village's efforts to learn the new technique. Um, and I tend to think that for many you know, women, this social component is particularly important again, exactly to counteract the kind of biases that we were seeing against their kind of inherent ability to learn, uh, which again, in, in, in our cases, they outperform the men on learning the techniques. So doing so publicly, honoring kind of their ability to do so publicly, I, I tend to think that social uh, civic component is, is a really crucial form of uh, reward for these guys. Excellent. 
Okay, just one last question. I know that um, your colleague, Dr. Mugarat, has been working on a COVID mask wearing project in Bangladesh that's very successful. And we hope to share that work more widely over the coming weeks. However, interestingly, interestingly, that project found that some of the incentives that we might expect to make a difference to farmer behaviour, such as financial incentives, social incentives, enforcement or text messages, didn't really seem to make any difference. How important is it then to understand the context within each communication program? Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll answer that. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I, I think what it shows is like when we started the project, the math project, and, and just for everybody's benefit, um, you know, beha behavior change is a common thread here. You know, in, in the Malawi case, Ariel and I were working on trying to get people to change their behavior to adopt a new agricultural technique. And now I've been working on how do we change behaviors and get people to start wearing masks and make that a social norm so that everybody wears masks. And uh, so we tried out in the mask case just because we did a trial with 350,000 people. So it was a very large scale one. So we could try out, you know, 20 different strategies. We tried out everything that was sensible, including the incentives that Ariel and I found in another context, um, text messages, making people make verbal commitments, you know. And then we learned that out of the 20 different strategies we tried, there's only four that really was necessary, right? Uh, the other things, and, 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 and so I think that suggests that, you know, exper I would say the bottom line message is that experimentation is important because it's really hard to predict like ex ante at the beginning, those 20 strategies, we tried them because they were sensible ones to try. And we learned that many of them are not, are not necessary. So, so trying things out, experimenting with it, doing some trial and error, I think can improve all of our work. Oh, excellent answer. And I, I really like that experimentation is important. So we should just get out there and start trying things and, and seeing what works with different communities. And that's uh, what farmers research. do. They experiment with things until they hit on something that works. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Ariel, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mubarak, thank you very much as well. We really appreciate you joining us um, and it's very interesting work. We'll be following up. We've got lots of questions. If you could go on the Q&A, um, there's three questions there. If you have the chance to, to answer them in writing, that would be great, Ariel. Uh, and, and, and Mubarak, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and thank I'm, you, yeah, thank you for joining us. And I'd like to now introduce Agalsi Bennett from uh, Digital Green. Digital Green is an NGO that partners with local organizations and uses technology to help increase farmer incomes. And today, Galsi will be talking to us about Digital Green's approaches to reach and communicate with farmers, and in particular, how they use video and integrated channels to share information with farmers. Uh, and also, she's going to talk about what they've learned and the obstacles they've faced. Welcome, Galsi. Thank you so much, Alison. Let me get my screen going. So, can you see the, we the slides? Indeed. Looking great. Perfect. And now, where did my? All right. And I'm still presenting. No. No, you're still. You've got your notes now. Oh, yep. Ah, I press that there. and see what happens. Uh, Am I? Yes. You have got your presentation. Perfect. Yeah, I wanted my notes handy <laughs> because, you know, that's important. So hi, everyone. My name is Jelsey Bennett. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I work for an NGO called Digital Green. As you can see on the screen, our, we use technology to help farmers lift themselves out of poverty. And today I'll be talking about our approach to reach farmers and communicate with them. Uh, particularly how we use video and also other channels to share information. And as Allison said, what we've learned and some of the obstacles we've also faced. So first I would like to um, describe who we typically work with. Um, we mainly work with smallholder farmers uh, with less than two hectares of land. Many have limited literacy, but increasingly farmers also have greater access to information, access to data plants and mobile phones and smartphones, especially in India, although this is not necessarily the case everywhere. But Digital Green works uh, mostly in Indian Ethiopia and also other geographies, but our main um, area of work has been India. Uh, we also work with extension agents. Um, traditional extension, as I'm sure many of you know, has focused on those face-to-face -face interactions using you know, approaches like the farmer field school or others. 
Um, but as you are probably also familiar, there are, uh, the extension systems are plagued with problems, um, mainly low budgets and low extension agent to farmer ratios, um, distances to cover, there can be really vast, um, but also other things such as uh, a need to um, upgrade extension materials and change the curriculum to update it to market needs and whatnot. Um, we're moving towards a more pluralistic extension model in which digital solutions can be cost effective and also support the efforts of the extension system on the ground. So at Digital Green, we tested an approach called the community video approach um, through which relevant agronomic content is shared via short locally produced videos that are by farmers for farmers and feature farmers themselves. And these are typically screened in group settings, such as uh, some sort of community meeting, village saving loan associations uh, meetings and uh, using these handheld projectors, as you can see on the screen. Through this approach, we've reached um, 2.3 million farmers, mostly women, and we've worked with 46,000 government extension agents. Um, we've also had our work evaluated through various rigorous randomized controlled trials. And here are some key findings. Um, they increase, there was an increase in uptake of practices up to 50%, an increase in yields up to 46%. And this really you know, depends on the crop. Um, increase in incomes up to 17% and 7% or seven times the cost effectiveness. This is especially relevant now during COVID and with travel restrictions that, you know, we've been able to continue reaching farmers uh, with an adapted approach, which I'll get to in a little bit. So we've learned a ton through the implementation of the community video approach. And one key learning is the importance of partnerships. Uh, we, we've been working with local extension departments, and therefore that's a system that is already in place. This helps us with the sustainability factor. There's a, a system, the extension agency, that can continue the work going forward. And although I mentioned earlier, a lot of extension systems are, you know, have low budgets and um, issues of that nature, um, we've been very fortunate that our government extension partners have really bought into the approach, seen it work, and have invested in equipment and staffing costs and so forth to implement this approach. Another key element is um, working through existing social networks, such as self-help groups, for instance. Uh, this builds on trust and the, social and the social cohesion that helps drive behavior change in farmers. Um, a question we keep asking ourselves is, how do we replicate social cohesion in a digital setting. I will address that in a little bit, but keep that in mind. Something else that we've learned is the importance of facilitation. Uh, we don't just show the video and like it's a going to the movie theater. <laughs> we actually train extension agents to facilitate discussions, ask questions, and then report back on the feedback from farmers. This helps us improve content, improve the approach, you know, we add elements of pedagogy and adult learning so that, you know, the facilitation is, um, you know, helps create the discussion and also hopefully incites those farmers attending these meetings to adopt the practices. We've also learned that the local context and peer-to-peer -peer learning is very critical. Um, when we screen these videos, farmers the first question farmers ask is typically, who is that on the video? You know, from what village is that person? So you can tell that, you know, seeing someone like yourself with, you know, in a similar village with a similar uh, climatic agronomic conditions, like that is powerful. So we found that featuring farmers themselves in these videos actually increase the adoption of practices. And I feel like I'm gonna make a lot of similar points to Ariel, which um, to Ariel's point um, of hearing it from multiple sources. I think uh, I, I am helping make that point, put that point across, but 
I also wanted to talk about the importance of tailoring content for women. Through a couple of experiments in Indian Uganda, we found that when messages were given by women to women, it increased their knowledge, their participation in decision making and adoptions of agronomic practices. Uh, and by knowledge, I mean, there was actually like a test, that, like a pre and post test and, you know, against a, a control group. Um, and in and, and this, the, all these increases uh, were against um, getting information from male counterparts. So now that I've uh, explained to all of you a little bit about our community video approach and how we can communicate with farmers, I wanted to tell you a little bit more of how we used it in particular for pest related issues. Um, as you all know, you know, these pest issues seem to be evolving. We need better and more timely early warning systems. So I just wanted to kind of hone in on that a little bit. In Kenya, we use the community video to train extension agents at the county level, how to produce videos on the mango fruit fly. So that includes things like control measures, for instance, different types of traps. Um, and that is basically the knowledge on, on video production and dissemination that resides with extension department. Um, we are starting a new project that will use a similar approach um, on video production working at the county level. And in this case, it's with a desert locust mitigation. But we're working with a partner who will bring um, the climate and weather data aspects to it so that there could be communication and warning systems when there's swarms that are arriving. And related to the fall armyworm, um, we tested in Ethiopia, the integration of messages to control fall armyworm. So we produce videos and showcasing um, practices to control the fall armyworm. And these were viewed for by over 25,000 people. Um, the videos promoted things such as pathogen verification and also encouraged farmers to call the integrated voice response or IVR line, which was operated by the Agricultural Transformation Agency. And then farmers could report um, sightings of fall armyworm on their plots, um, ask questions, and you know, report whether they needed chemical treatments that maybe that was not locally available and so forth. But the results that we got were not what we were hoping to get. We were hoping to hear that this integration was going to be fabulous. But instead, we learned that integrating data was extremely tough. We had video viewership data and the adoption of practices data through video viewership. We had survey data on fall armyworm incidences. We had pheromone trap data and all of it had different levels of granularity. And it was just not, we couldn't make much sense of it. Um, but basically all this technology we were using between the IVR line and the video and the traps you know, it was not our silver bullet. But this situation got us thinking about data. Um, and actually the findings served as the evidence for the creation of an interoperable protocol for secure data sharing and exchange. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United Kingdom's foreign, the FCDO is a foreign cooperation development office um, have invested in a in this protocol called FarmStack, which Digital Green has created, that is allowing us to um, secure the data exchange for data to talk to each other, basically. Um, what we've been also focusing on in relation to this and the learnings from this uh, um, work in Ethiopia is that, you know, farmers have to have agency and have to know what they're sharing and what, what is their data. You know, their data has a lot of value. So what we are hoping to do is that, you know, create the, the secure exchange, data exchange system so that uh, their data is protected and then farmers can choose what information they want and need to, you know, support their work. And that's a little worm right there. In there. And, um, but we've also um, three minutes. Learned, okay, 
We've also learned that um, integrating channels or how information is share shared can reinforce messaging. Um, some channels are just better for static content like videos, um, but other channels like IVR or SMS or text messaging is better for timely content delivery like early warning systems. We've also learned people have different styles of learning. Some people learn by doing, others are visual learners. So the key is to really have all these channels available that integrate um, or that ultimately drive to behavior change. Um, we've also been working on using WhatsApp, especially in India, where it's uh, very popular. Um, I mentioned the importance of social cohesion earlier, and we've been trying to replicate uh, that on an online setting through WhatsApp groups. Um, it's very tough, but we've learned that the facilitation of a trusted extension agent is helpful because it helps mirror that sort of so social network that it, you know, is on the ground. We've also tested chatbots to communicate with farmers. And a chatbot is a computer program that is designed to simulate a human conversation. The cool thing about a chatbot is that it's not just a push of information, but the farmers can pull or ask for what is needed. Um, but there's been a lot of um, things that we've learned about this is that typing in some languages is very difficult and therefore voice memos can be popular and we need to think about the integration of voice technologies. Also, while many women have access to phones, uh, sometimes they don't get to keep the phones with them at all times. So we've been encouraging uh, that listening to IVR messages or engaging with a chatbot is done as a family so that everybody gets to participate. Uh, another challenge has been onboarding farmers who may, um, you know, through our service, we found that the majority of farmers find chatbots to be useful, but sometimes they think it's spam messages. So it is important to socialize this idea in advance and to build um, community trust. Um, but it seems that a lot of this um, community building, trust building can fall in the extension agent. And that's a person that's already pretty busy. Um, but our idea is that these digital tools then become something that the extension agent can use to really reach more people more widely and complement that in-person support they're already providing. So hopefully it's a way to reach more people uh, in, more, in an easier way. All right, um, I'm going to wrap up with some key takeaways to effectively communicate with farmers to drive behavior change. And the first one is putting the farmer first um, and, and really getting feedback to help us iterate on content and design. Uh, secondly, as mentioned earlier, technology is not really a silver bullet. It's, it's a definitely an amplifier, but it's not a be all end all solution. Um, then the human element is really important. The partnerships and networks, uh, all that is really what makes um, a lot of these messaging and behavior change work. Data is also a great amplifier. It is, helps us be more precise. Um, but of course, they're, they're, we need to make sure that data can be exchanged securely and efficiently. And lastly, um, integrated, the integration of channels can increase reach and impact. We don't see it as a competition, to the contrary. Uh, layering, video, radio, um, you know, SMS, et cetera, can definitely help farmers and help us um, you know, communicate with them and drive that behavior change. So with that, uh, thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Kelsey, and that was um, excellent. It's great to see the success you've had with informing farmers uh, and changing practices in the field with, with your, you know, your use of the videos, for, for example, and these other, other channels. Um, really, really nice to see the selection of local farmers and how important that is. Just a question around that. How, um, how do you select them? I mean, is it difficult to get local farmers to appear in your videos? It hasn't been tough. I think, um, you know, we work again, we work, we really rely a lot on those social networks. You know, we will get recommendations from our, um, uh, you know, the extension workers we've been working with to, you know, who, who may want to be featured, who has something to show. So it is an exchange with, you know, the, the community or with the extension agent to help identify those people um, who want to be featured, who, um, 
who are sometimes the first adopters. Yeah. And, and do you need to create different videos to reach out to different groups, for example, for women? Are they, are they videos that obviously have women in, in them, but are there different ways that you communicate to different segments within the farming populations? Yeah, yeah. So for sure, we're creating many different types of videos. I think our YouTube channel has something like, I don't know how many, <laughs> like 6,000 videos in 50 oh, wow. different languages. So yeah, yeah a, a lot of videos in, in very localized and very tailored because we find out that, that that's a key element and hmm. to to drive that behavior change. So yeah, they, they're definitely um, very much tailored to their needs. Also to, you know, as you said, uh, to women farmers versus the male farmers, sometimes the youth farmers, you know, yeah. we want to make sure we, we target those segments. Great. And um, have you have you designed or combined your digital green kind of resources with local radio and TV stations? Uh, efforts as well? I, I don't know if TV necessarily. Um, I definitely know that with radio, we've done um, alignment, for instance, mm -hmm. where, you know, we will maybe be showcasing at the at, at a regional level, a set of videos about a certain practice because it's the right season and then in coordination with other groups. Yeah. Um, you know, this is similar dissemination of information, same, similar messaging on radio. Yeah. Um, question here, if women don't own the mobile devices sometimes, do they share it with their husbands and male family members? And do you see a difference in between, like, for example, you're working in India, do you have you seen a difference with that? the behavior around phones and who uses it uh, compared to Ethiopia? Yeah, so yeah, in many cases, it's like the family cell phone, the family smartphone. And, you know, typically the male head of household may keep that during the day, but then it's available for the family to keep in the evening, for instance. So uh, we've seen uh, many different uh, ways um, of how the, the the phone is shared in the family unit. Um, and this is more so in India. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm actually not exactly sure um, in Ethiopia how it's shared or uh, if it's shared. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, um, I don't have information on the data, uh, on the data plans, for instance, but I do know um, certain things that include that data in India, for instance, is much cheaper. So our ability to use to do experiments with, you know, chatbots and WhatsApp yeah, groups, yeah. it's because that data is is available. That that's not necessarily the case, in in other cases. Just like um, someone meant, um, there was a question earlier from, you know, from Afghanistan, for instance. Um, there was some um, curious. Habibullah said that yeah, there's no access in rural areas, so you know, in some places it just would not work. It would have to be an in-person facilitated approach. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. One last question for you, and then we have to go on to our next speaker. Um, but this one is, um, it's a good one, as in, it says, thank you for your presentation. And with 6,000 videos in 50 different languages, uh, etc., on, and they assume it's there on YouTube, how do you ensure farmers can filter and get to the video they might be interested in to see or access that information they're looking for? Good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So yeah, there, there is a, you know, there's like a search function, uh, people subscribe. I've noticed I've posted videos. Um, I posted a video in Kirwanda that's made by some Rwandan counterparts and people in India were like, oh, okay, we need subtitles for this video. I'm interested in seeing this video. So uh, yeah, it, it, it does require a little bit of digging. Uh, for the right content and you know hopefully the YouTube um, search con um, feature helps with that but yeah I, I think we um, we've created playlists for instance when there's like specialized content we want to share and I'm gonna I'll, I'll put the link up um, on the Excellent. chat. Great well I'm, I'm going to um, thank you very much for your presentation and um, I uh, it's a delight having you here and I know that you may not spend the rest of the time with us because it's late uh, in the US where you're based but thank you so much for joining us very interesting and everyone will have a chance to see the links that uh, Jelsey will share with you um, related to digital green so thank you Jelsey. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, now, before we move to our next speaker, I just want to highlight some recent work in Vietnam by Dr. Hong from the Hugh University, and he investigated the use of information and communication technologies by Vietnamese smallholder farmers. And I just wanted to sort of, um, I guess, emphasize that his research found that Vietnam Vietnamese smallholder farmers were using a variety of technologies to access agricultural information. But one of the barriers was the lack of knowledge and skills for using apps on mobile phones. And so education was an aspect that could be really helpful in this context. Interestingly, Dr. Hong's research also found a statistically significant relationship existing between the extent of mobile phone use and the smallholders' age, gender, and the type of household they came from. And a statistically significant relationship also existed between the extent of radio network broadcast use and the smallholders' uh, age and gender. So I really want you to keep that in mind when we uh, turn to our next two speakers, because I'm very pleased to now introduce our Third speaker today, Siddharth Surana um, from Agri Central, uh, where he's the founder uh, of this uh, company, and he's also the digital lead for Olam in India. Welcome, Siddharth. Do you um, are you with us? I can see you yes, are. You're uh, unmuted. Yeah, very much, Alison. Excellent. Um, would you like to load your presentation, or would you like me to load it? Up to you. Yeah, no, I, I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Uh, Perfect. I hope uh, it's visible. It is, just needs to go into yeah. full screen and it is perfect. Yeah. Excellent, welcome. Thank you, Alison. And I hope I can start. Yes, go for it. Okay, great. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone, and maybe good evening, good night in other parts of the world. Uh, here is Siddharth Surana from India. Uh, as Alison said, uh, you know, I, I am with Olam and I'm leading the digital vertical in India. And I'm also uh, kind of a founder for a startup uh, of a startup called AgriCentral. AgriCentral is a uh, part of uh, Ulam's uh, futuristic vision towards building a large farmer services platform. And Ulam is uh, taking it quite seriously, uh, especially as uh, many of you know that Ulam works very uh, extensively with the smallholder farmers and uh, in, in the countries where typically, you know, uh, other agri corporates uh, are not that much uh, present. So Ulam has been working with uh, millions of farmers for quite some time. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, giving them extension, giving them inputs, as well as buying their produce. But now with the, the whole, uh, you know, uptick in terms of, you know, uptake of uh, digitally delivered, you know, information, as well as, you know, the penetration of smartphones and internet in many of the middle income and even low income countries, uh, including India, uh, you know, there has been a, a conscious uh, thought uh, inside Olam that how do we leverage uh, this digital access to to reach out to uh, more farmers, including those who may not be doing anything with Olam, uh, who may not be selling their crops to Olam or may not even be growing the crops which uh, Olam buys uh, and trades in the world markets and build a standalone and eventually sustainable uh, business out of that. So uh, I'll just start off uh, with our experience in, uh, you know, in communicating in the farm with the farmers. Uh, but before that, I'll just give you a little bit of introduction about uh, what AgriCentral is and how it works for the farmers. Okay, so this is our vision, uh, mission that, you know, uh, to help farmers make better decisions using technology driven information and advisory that's deliver, delivered at scale uh, digitally, uh, as I think a couple of previous speakers uh, noted. Uh, that you know, digital is the way uh, when you want to reach uh, any kind of users at a large scale and cost effectively, and uh, thereby empowering the farmers to increase their profitability in a sustainable ma manner, uh, sustainable uh, not only economically but also ecologically. Uh, and you know, the other definitions of sustainable are included when we say sustainable. Okay, so this is how uh, you know Agri Central has been built. So give, uh, we give you know, smallholder farmers information and uh, decision support in five Indian languages. Uh, apart from English, which is uh, quite uh, well spoken in, in India, we have uh, uh, four other languages, Hindi, Marathi, Kannada, and Telugu. Okay, and uh, with that, uh, we uh, deliver the farmers uh, information over a free Android application, mobile application. Uh, and these are uh, six uh, uh, key services that we give to the farmers. The first one is pest and disease management. It goes by the name crop care. We have currently 33 crops and we are building advisory content 
on more crops. So by this year end, we have a target to reach 50 crops. Within that, we cover uh, 1,200 pest and disease. And uh, daily on our platform, we see more than 10,000 farmers di diagnosing their uh, crops problems. Then the, the next one is a crop plan, which delivers good farming practices to the farmers. So on the application, farmers get uh, uh, for, the, for the day what needs to be done in their farm based on their crop, based on their type of cultivation and some other parameters. We give them the package of practices. Uh, in this one, we have 39 crops. Out of them, 33 are common between crop care and crop plant. And we also cover, you know, when we talk about inputs in, you know, whatever stage of the farming, be it uh, uh, pre-sowing fertilization or be it, you know, weeding uh, through weedicides or eventually, you know, uh, some micronutrients. So we have uh, close to 800 chemicals. And within that, we, uh, we publish uh, 4,000 brands as of now, we have no inputs business, but we a uh, lot of the times farmers don't understand the chemical names. And when they go out uh, to buy the chemicals in the markets, they need to know a brand. And a lot of farmers are showing these brand pictures to the local dealers or retailers, and through that, uh, they are buying. Uh, and so that's the whole idea behind showing the exact brands to the farmers. The third one is a quite popular feature for the farmers. We call it market view. <clears throat> Within that, farmers can see uh, you know their crops prices uh, nearby in the nearby markets as well as far off markets so it's a very telescopic kind of view that when you start off you see the nearby markets but you can filter out to see your state's markets and then your countries uh, which is india's markets uh, in that we cover 114 crops uh, close to 1700 markets and more than 15000 price points so each price point is basically a combination of a crop its variety and the location and these three are the determinants largely of any agricultural good. Uh, so we uh, specify you know, all these three parameters when we talk about a price on that day. Uh, the fourth one is also a heavily popular feature among the farmers, wherein we give them agri or rural uh, relevant news uh, to the farmers. And uh, within that, we also cover you know, the government schemes, subsidies, any programs for the farmers, crop insurance, fertilizer subsidy, and so on. Uh, so we have so far published uh, 238 government schemes. We publish every week uh, more than 70 news articles. And the third feature within this uh, bulletin is uh, agri events. So if you have any agri expo nearby you as a farmer or any uh, Krishi Mela as we call in Hindi, uh, agri fair, or any such events where farmers can go and interact with other farmers, or providers of any kind of services or products to the farmers or even uh, government officials when they organize such events. We put that out into the application and farmers can see the location where it is going to be held, uh, the date and time, and they can save in their calendar. So it is linked with your Google calendar as well as Google map so that you can see the distance to the venue as well. Uh, the, the, fourth, uh, the fifth one is uh, again, a very interactive feature uh, and farmers call it like a Facebook for farmers. We call it Farm Voice. Uh, in that, uh, farmers can communicate with the fellow farmers, they can share their problems, they can give solution to other farmers, they can share their success stories. So basically, you can upload your pictures, you can upload video links, and uh, we also try to you know, uh, solve some of the queries of the farmers where we see either other users are not uh, able to respond, or if we see too many conflicting opinions, so we try to give our official version as Agri Central. Uh, but it is largely community-driven platform. Uh, I'll, I'll show some of the screenshots of this particular feature later. And uh, the sixth one is uh, weather, wherein we have, the I think, the longest uh, weather horizon in terms of any agricultural app in India. We give 15 days forecast uh, to the farmers. And within that, we give a very micro level forecast in terms of three hourly updates uh, to the farmers. Now, this has been the kind of growth that we've seen for AgriCentral. We launched it uh, just on the New Year's Eve, um, you know, in, in 2019, uh, and then, uh, as, as I said, it's free for the farmers. Since then, we have seen, uh, you know, a good growth, uh, uh, and now currently we are at 4.63 million downloads. Uh, I would like to share that, you know, for the first five or six months, the growth was very, very slow because we hadn't really cracked the digital way of communication, and we have been meeting the farmers mostly on ground, meeting the farmers' cooperatives the farmer producer organizations, as we call FPOs in India, and so on, and you know, uh, doing village level meetings in some village temple or you know, at, at a meeting place. So 
and in each meeting we would have you know uh, 30 to 40 farmers only so it was quite a slow progress but eventually we figured out uh, uh, in fact the, the the light bulb moment was for me personally that if it's a digital app which is uh, going to be seen by farmers and used by the farmers who are on a smartphone having internet connection then they must be on other platforms so why not let us go and meet them where they would be found and i'll show you some of the examples of that currently we have users in more than 30 states of india and uh, it was a proud moment when we got featured as one of the best made in india applications by google itself uh, yeah so this has been a kind of validation you can go to google play store and search for agricentral you can read the reviews and comments uh, now uh, now this is what i call it uh, as a communication sorry yeah so basically uh, uh, you know this is a typical persona of a farmer uh, called Nagabhushan. He is a small holder from Anantapur, a drought-prone district in Andhra Pradesh. He cultivates maize on his uh, three acres land, but is not at all happy with the yields as well as his cost of cultivation, which goes up every year. He's always in doubt also that if he's getting the fair produce of his maize, fair price of his produce uh, after all this hard work. So in our opinion, he will surely benefit by using every center. But the question is that how does he know that AgriCentral exists? How does he discover? Or how do we reach him? How will he know that AgriCentral can help solve his problems? And how do we, once we have established some contact, how do we remain engaged with him? So these are the three big questions we face every day while communicating with the farmers. And why these questions become uh, even more difficult to solve is because of these uh, hurdles. Right? So first of all, since uh, uh, we have a lot of written content which needs to be read to, to use AgriCenter, is he educated enough to use AgriCenter? Is he educated enough to first of all find AgriCenter uh, and download and you know do uh, the registration on on his own? Then uh, does he have a smartphone with internet? Right. While smartphone penetration in India is a phenomenal uh, story in itself, and uh, as as Jesley uh, uh, Jelsey, uh, sorry. Uh, mentioned uh, just a few minutes back that you know India has one of the cheapest rates uh, with um, uh, 50 cents per GB data. And so the proliferation of smartphones and internet has been, especially mobile uh, internet has been phenomenal, but there are still a lot of farmers who are either having no, no kind of phone at all or having the legacy feature phone, right? So by definition, we are restricted to our smartphone users. So we need to know if he has a smartphone with internet. Then uh, in India, there are you know, more than 25 major languages and hundreds of other languages. So do we have every center in Naga's uh, language? Okay. Uh, so we, we don't uh, call it uh, uh, a, a gap in, uh, in, on his side, but uh, the on onus is on us to provide uh, in that language, which the user understands, which the farmer understands. And uh, do we cover uh, maize as a crop? Okay, because he would be interested in maize only. Then where can we meet him? Uh, on ground, digitally, on what media should we look for farmers like Nagabhushan? And then uh, the biggest question of all is that, will Nagabhushan trust us? Because you know the trust is uh, a key factor in the, in the entire communication, entire puzzle, in fact. And even if you reach a farmer, even if you convince them, uh, is your advisory and information relevant enough? It is use useful enough uh, to trust uh, it over and above, you know, what the local retailer is saying, what the local middleman uh, is saying when they are buying the produce, or even the fellow farmers are saying, if, if there's any conflict in opinion or information, would he trust us over the other sources, right? And this uh, extension is a serious business. I think uh, quite a few people in this room know that, that a farmer's entire livelihood for that crop season depends on that. So farmers would be very, very, uh, you know, uh, you can say skeptical when they are, uh, you know, experimenting with any new medium and any new player, especially when uh, they don't have a face attached, right? So these are some of the challenges when we do things digitally at scale, and you can call it mass personalization if you like. Okay, now, how are we trying to solve some of these questions? Okay, so first of all, how do we reach Nagabhushan? Again, you know, the same questions, we have come full circle to look at them. Okay, so as I said, you know, uh, since our target audience base is uh, internet uh, connected farmers, we would like to meet them where they are most likely to be found. And in India, the top three applications uh, as far as social media is concerned are WhatsApp, number one, 
Facebook number two and YouTube number three. And we know already that quite a few farmers are using face, uh, YouTube videos to look at good agricultural practices and any new tools and techniques. Uh, then we uh, try to introduce Agri Central to him in a language that he understands. Okay, and uh, through an engaging story that he can relate with, we try to introduce uh, Agri Central. So I, I'll just uh, show some of these, uh, you know, stories so that you know we can we can just uh, relate. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. uh, I hope my audio is uh, is working fine. Yeah, one second. I'll just uh, use this link. So this is a very very um, uh, basic animation video, I would say, but uh, this has really worked wonders for us, you know, in terms of reaching out to the farmers and uh, telling them about uh, Agri Central. Yeah. हमारे युवा किसान सत्यवाद से शहर से पढ़कर आया ये नौजवान वैज्ञानिक तरीकों से खेती करता है और भरपूर फसल उगाता है किसान किशन लाल सत्यवान ने कुछ सोचकर किशन लाल की तीन एकड़ जमीन पांच लाख रुपए में खरीद ली और किशन लाल ने शहर का रुख किया जब वह गांव वापस आया तो देखता है कि उसके खेत का तो काया पलट हो गया सत्या भाई मैं अपना खेत वापस लेना चाहता हूँ क्या कहते हो भैया बुरा मत मानना पर मैं इसे बेचना नहीं चाहता इस खेत में बहुत मेहनत की है मैंने ये तो सरासर बेमानी है मैं ये मामला पंचायत में ले जाऊंगा भैया जब जमीन आपके पास थी तो एकड़ की मुश्किल से चार क्विंटल सोयाबीन होती थी अब पूरे नौ क्विंटल होता भी है ये तुमने कैसे किया या। और पैदावार बढ़ती गई इस ऐप में है मेरे छह सच्चे साथी पहला है क्रॉप प्लान ये मुझे अपनी ओके सो आई जस्ट पॉज हियर सो आई होप आई एम ऑडिबल Yeah, no, that's good. That gives us a good example. Um, that's probably enough. We're just sort of saying a bit of a, but a really good example. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, basically, you know, this one is about you know a farmer who comes back from a city and you know uh, does and uh, tries to do farming, but he does in a modern way, and he he acquires a plot of another farmer which was not producing too much uh, yield. but when he does all that agri central says and does you know take a good uh, crop out of that the farmer who sold him uh, he wants to take the land back and they get into a dispute so while uh, he goes to the village panchayat as we call in india it's like a community where they solve the villages problem uh, the the head of the panchayat uh, gets interested in how he turn around the farm and then he introduces uh, you know agri central apart from that you know Uh, I'll just uh, one one minute, Sinha, yeah, before yeah. end. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so you know, uh, we also try to give them examples of how Agri Central can help the, uh, them solve relatable problems. So I'll just show you that one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so and we try to do that uh, through. Uh, yeah so this is a, a, a youtube influencer these are farmers the guy in the turban he mm -hmm. is uh, he has he runs a youtube channel uh, with uh, more than uh, 4.5 million subscribers and through them we you know take some interviews give some real life examples of uh, you know how farmers can use agri central and benefit out of that i'll not really play the video uh, of course you know i can share the, the presentation uh, with anyone who is interested okay and uh, then i'll just move on to the remaining pieces uh, which are basically once we have uh, you know onboarded these farmers okay uh, but yeah just before i move on to that uh, you know these influencers help uh, us a great deal in you know in um, uh, getting heard as well as you know they have a lot of credibility and trust among the farmers so we uh, through their influence uh, we get um, some entry uh, towards uh, farmers okay but after that we use you know an, the in app feature called farm voice where the farmers you know can ask their questions can share their problems 
And if you can see on your right hand side, we also try to uh, reply those uh, questions. And this is a very engaging uh, platform within the application, within AgriCenter. Apart from that, we use notification quite heavily to you know, remind the farmers about what's happening in their farm today, what activity they need to do, and also towards the news bulletin items, which could be very relevant to the farmers. We have a small call-in feature uh, wherein farmers can you know, dial a number and uh, record their calling preference uh, and their language in which they want to be called back. And our team of uh, agri experts, they call the farmers and understand their query and try to resolve. And we have a very vibrant uh, Facebook page of ourselves where we publish a lot of content and farmers are you know, engaged through that. Okay, so yeah, by the time it loads, uh, you know, uh, I think this is from my side uh, when it uh, comes to how we are communi communicating with the farmers as well as was, uh, what AgriCentral has to offer to the farmers. This is my email ID. You can um, connect with me uh, on this uh, email. And thank you very much. Looking forward to the questions. Great, Siddharth. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentation. I actually really like the examples. And everyone will have a, a copy of the presentation, so you'll be able to click on some of the links. And they're definitely worth um, looking at, too, because I really like the use of the farmer influences in the YouTube. Uh, example, um, and they're, they're quite fun to look at, even though I don't actually understand anything. I can sort of get a bit of an idea. But um, how do you choose those influences, those YouTube influences? Do you just go th search through and see who's uh, posting on YouTube and which farmers are saying what? Or do you go and um, ask farmers to be your YouTube influences? What's your approach? Yeah. I think largely we have found these YouTubers, you know, because they are so popular, right? Uh, for mm. example, this person, Darshan Singh, he has this channel called Farming Leader. He has close to 5 million subscribers. There are quite a few with uh, 3 million, 2 million subscribers. So yeah. when we, uh, for example, started to build uh, our own videos and started to put on YouTube, YouTube itself gives, you know, similar videos. I think it was quite organic discovery that we kept on finding these YouTubers. And uh, since um, myself and quite a few other members in the team are there in the sector for some time, uh, we have some prior knowledge of you know, these YouTubers. Most of them are interestingly themselves farmers. So you know, out of their urge to you know, educate other farmers, since they are farmers and educated and, uh, and young, in fact, they, they, uh, some of them want to you know, help other farmers uh, with yeah. new techniques and all. So uh, from that urge, they started their channels and now they are quite popular. Okay, and a question that, I mean, a topic that's come up quite a bit in today's um, presentations, earlier ones, um, was women. Do you have any women farmer influencers on YouTube? Uh, uh, unfortunately, not too many, uh, Alison. In fact, uh, like many other, uh, you know, uh, middle income and low income countries, in India too, you know, uh, the women's, all the women's participation in workforce actually is uh, very high, even in farming sector, mm -hmm. but even their access to phones is quite limited. And when we see some of the data, like, you know, who has seen our videos and all that, I think women's participation, even in audience is, uh, is close to 10 to 20 percent uh, yeah. in, in that range. And the average would be 12 percent, I would say. So, okay. yeah, uh, that's, that's a sad reality. OK. And, and, and is there something that you're doing to try and increase or reach out to women farmers through, through AgriCentral? Uh, nothing too specific, uh, because first of all, we want to reach out to the farmers. But uh, off late, we have uh, started to create more women characters uh, in the videos. Okay. And for example, our latest video uh, about uh, farm voice is about a farmer who doesn't know too much about applications and all, but his wife, uh, while sitting in the farm, she was uh, using her phone. And the farmer says that, why are you chatting on the phone while I'm working uh, hard? So she says, no, 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 I'm trying to help you out. And then she introduces uh, the app to her husband. So okay. this is the way we're okay. trying to build a, a different story around this. Okay. Now, um, I've got a couple of questions. We have to be very quick now because we're running out of time. But one yeah. is, do you have a forewarning or early warning of forecasting services for pests and diseases in the crops location? Yeah, we are in the process of building that. Now, because, you know, when, when the farmers uh, use our app, they also upload their pictures of their crop. And based on that, we are building um, a big uh, ML and AI, machine learning and AI-based tool which will okay. help us give, you know, very timely information to the farmers, including forecasting. Excellent. Uh, quick, another quick question um, here is, uh, what are you doing during the pandemic? How do you effectively communicate and engage the farmers during social distancing? Or actually, do you have on your app any messaging around COVID? 
Sure. In safety. No, no, in fact, we use our influence very heavily to educate the farmers on all the, you know, um, containment practices and uh, hygiene and, you know, safekeeping during COVID times. So we must have published, uh, published you know, more than 1,200 different kind of messages, short videos and other content onto the application and, uh, you know, otherwise as well on, on Facebook and YouTube. And in fact, we have been cited in Olam's annual report as one of the key examples of how we educated farmers on COVID management. Excellent. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Very interesting. There's lots of great um, information for people to click on to and, and discover more about AgriCentral. And we're, we're very pleased to have had you join us this morning. So thank you so much. Um, and and all the panelists as well as the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Roger Matalang, who is the President and National Chairperson of the Philippine Federation of Rural Broadcasters. Roger will talk to us about the power of radio to communicate to farmers in the Philippines. And Roger, do you want me to load the presentation or could you load the presentation? You're just, you're just muted, I'll just unmute you. You may just have to unmute yourself, Roger. Okay. Yes. Would you would you like me to load your presentation, or can you load it? You, you please load it. Okay. Okay. So first of all, I wish to thank you, Ma'am Alison. Uh, for participating in this uh, webinar through Dr. Rex Navarro, who is supposed to do this presentation, but he has another commitment. And uh, I'd like to share you. First of all, I'm Rogelio Matalang of uh, the Department of Agriculture Regional Field Office 2, located at Tugigaro City, Cagayan, Philippines. And uh, may I share with you our experience in so far as radio-based distance learning on climate smart agriculture is concerned. In uh, 2016, we enrolled uh, 10,078 uh, farmers in the provinces of Cagayan, Isabela, Biscaya, and Girino, uh, employing the uh, convergence initiative, we have partner agencies like the Agricultural Training Institute of uh, DA Regional Office 2, the International Rice Research Institute uh, based in uh, UP Los Baños, Laguna, and the Climate Change Agriculture and Food Security in Southeast Asia based in Hanoi, Vietnam, with the participation of uh, uh, the Philippine Federation of Rural Broadcasters throughout uh, the country and the members of the Philippine Agricultural Journalists. We also have partners uh, in the government stations, private stations, and community radio stations established by the Philippine Federation of uh, Rural uh, Broadcasters. And uh, the school on there on smart rice agriculture had four objectives. One, uh, facilitate the massive and sustained education of small holder farmers on climate smart agriculture in Cagayan Valley through radio. Second, heighten awareness and mobilize strong support and involvement of the rural population in agriculture programs. Third, Engage government agencies, local government units, state universities and colleges, civil society organizations, and the private sector in regional agriculture programs. It also serves as a quick feedback um, mechanism among agriculture and fisheries stakeholders in the region or Cagayan Valley. Now, why radio? In the Philippines, researchers has uh, have proven that radio is an effective medium in information dissemination, especially in rural areas. It is most cost effective and most pervasive and medium reaching the remote areas of the country. 
Only radio can reach the unreached, where there is no electricity in rural areas where rice farmers are located. The advantages of radio, have, we have four transistor radios operate with dry cell batteries or solar equipped, which can be charged on uh, AC uh, DC connection. It is also very handy and very cheap and the only source of information and entertainment in the countryside. Community radio stations, which were established by the Philippine Federation of Rural Broadcasters, where we have 10 in the region, were tapped to air government programs in agriculture, fisheries, and other fields for free. Uh, because community radio stations are non-commercial in nature. Now, what are the advantages of radio? Transistor radios operate with the dry cell. Yeah, I have mentioned it. I think it's duplicated. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, why the school on the air on smart rice agriculture? The list of rice farmers who were enrolled about 10,000 enrollees were registered with the local government units through the registry system for basic sectors in agriculture or RSDSA. However, the enrollees were not limited to the registered ones. Walk-in participants who are not enrollees were also accommodated. And uh, the school on the air on smart rice agriculture where was reinforced employing field days during harvest season, techno demo trainings. We also distribute uh, information, education and communication print materials. And we share with our municipal agriculturist office uh, audiovisual presentations on livelihood. And of course, our live broadcast in our own radio station, BZDA FM of the Department of Agriculture, were also shared through social media, through our Facebook account, DA Cagayan Valley. And uh, in, uh, in the, after the conduct of the graduation exercises of the more than 5,000 who were uh, declared graduates because some dropped out since one of their problems is the lack of uh, transistor radio. Now to address this, some municipal agriculturists conducted a group listening in their respective uh, uh, barangay uh, halls. And so when uh, the uh, distribution of interventions came, we were able to get uh, feedbacks from our farmers, especially in the distribution of free seeds, fertilizer, pesticide for crops, and even dispersal of poultry and livestock to farmers affected by calamities like the ASF, African swine fever. We also have the FAW, FAW, or fall almyworm, brown plant hopper, and bird flu. Comments and suggestions among listeners uh, and viewers are addressed by focal persons and subject matter specialists on different commodities. And this is done where we receive feedbacks or uh, messages from uh, through the Facebook while our programs are being live streamed. Uh, and so of course, uh, uh, in the next uh, season of uh, uh, dry cropping season for rice, the department uh, will be able will implement another unified school on the air throughout the country uh, and is targeting to enroll about 300,000 farmers in the first season of uh, its uh, operation this year. And so we are looking of the possibility of uh, uh, pushing through with this unified on the air to ensure uh, food uh, sufficiency, especially in the stable crop, stable crop rice. 
in the Philippines, uh, region two is uh, rank number one in corn production and only number two in rice uh, production. Uh, there are some uh, uh, testimonies which I included in my slides, like one from uh, Malinta Tuwao Cagayan, who, who is very thankful of the in interventions given by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, I wish to emphasize also that uh, most of our outstanding farmers are women like Digna Antonio and even our mayors, our local government uh, executives are active participants in whatever programs the Department of Agriculture is uh, implementing. So for that, I wish to thank you for having given me this chance to share our experiences in the School on the Air on Smart Rice Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. And I'm really struck by the amount of farmers that you're reaching out to via radio. I think in the last example, you were looking at a development of a program to reach out to 300,000 farmers. Is that right? Yes. It's yeah, incredible. It's this is in the entire country, uh, among 36 rice producing uh, provinces from Luzon, Visayas and Mindanao. Yeah, and I'm just gonna share with the audience as well. I mean, there's a whole um, resource that's been developed around how to even develop these radio programs. Uh, and I will share that in the um, in the email that I send out to all participants, because it's, it's really nice to see how you've really thought about how to structure and how to design these radio programs. How, I mean, how hard is it to actually get farmers to enroll? I know that you, you try and use different ways to attract them. How, how are, they, are they willing to enroll? Are they excited about it? Is it easy to get people to enroll in the program and stay with the program? With the municipal agriculture office, last month, or I think the other month, there were reports of the uh, presence of fall army worm in three towns in our province of Cagayan. However, uh, there, there were uh, in the province of Isabela ahead of time and again. And our experts from the regional crop protection center immediately went to the areas to confirm and immediately uh, this was addressed by uh, spraying insecticides uh, authorized by the fertilizer and pesticide authority 10 days after planting. These are the recommended uh, management practices. And also three to five days after spraying insecticides, uh, they apply biocontrol agents like trichogramma, okay. heroin, and uh, metarizium. Okay. And, but, but uh, Roger, how, how easy is it, I mean, with these radio broadcast programs, with the climate broadcast program, are farmers, are they, is it easy to get them to enroll? Do they want to enroll in these programs? I mean, you had 10,000 um, people enroll. Was, was that relatively easy to get them interested in the radio programs? Yes, the, because the master list comes from the registry system for basic sectors in agriculture ah, okay. in, the, in the office of the municipal agriculturist. Okay. And uh, these are the farmers who were given interventions like free seeds, free fertilizer, free insecticides. And so uh, their interest in uh, uh, listening to our broadcast programs is really very high. In fact, uh, we have two ongoing schools on the air now in the region. Uh, yeah. One in the province of uh, Quirino and Weba Biscaya, where there are 3,000 farmers enrolled who are planting inbred uh, rice. Okay. Yeah. And another, another program on school on the air is our uh, highland vegetable production with 500 enrollees again in the municipality or municipalities of Nueva Vizcaya. Okay, and do farmers get a certificate or is there an incentive 
such as that for farmers to get when they complete the course or are there any sort of post course uh, sort of recognition of, of their participation? Yes, uh, the schools on the air are being, being conducted uh, require them to answer the quiz portion at the end of the lesson. Ah, okay. They have to, to pass a final exam. Otherwise, ah. they, will not be, they will not be given a certificate of completion and will not be allowed to graduate. Okay, and that's quite effective, obviously, at getting people to, um, to finish the course and complete it. Yes, they have to. <laughs> Excellent. And, uh, and do they uh, get, is there any um, financial incentives or is it mostly through those social incentives of a certificate? Uh, is there any other ways that you, that you um, incentivize them to complete the course? Yes, they have to. Otherwise, yeah. they will be dropped from the list and will not be given certificates of uh, completion. Okay. Uh, plus they, they will miss the uh, incentives uh, which will be given to top notchers in quizzes. Uh, we also declare valedictorian, salutatorian, plus oh, uh, awesome. incentives like uh, seeds, fertilizer, and other farming tools. Oh, excellent. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm, I'm just, it's, it's a really interesting um, program and, and I will, as I said, send more information around to everyone because uh, there's actually a whole sort of uh, production of resources that have, that, that actually partner this, this approach. So thank you so much for joining us uh, and thank you for standing in for Rex. I mean, you're brilliant. So uh, it's been lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much too, Mum Alisa. Thank you. I'd now like to invite our last, our final speaker today, Adani Romney from uh, CAVI. She's the Global Director of Development and Communication and Extension there. She's joining us from England in the very early hours of the morning. Um, so we're very pleased to have you with us talking about hybrid communications and I guess the power of hybrid communications to reach farmers. Welcome, Dani. Thank you. Um, thanks, Alison. Um, okay, I the the um, can I share my own presentation? Yes, you can. I made do. Few, I'm just going to stop um, share. I made a few changes. Um, so if that's okay. That's. Uh, great. Oops. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, yes, good morning to everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. I'm uh, still in the dark, as you can see. Um, I wanted to talk today um, about some of the experiences that CABI has had. Um, I work for CABI. I'm based in the um, Africa office, but I um, work with the colleagues across the, across the world in um, Asia and Latin America, as well as Africa. And I wanted to talk about some of the social behavioral change um, work particularly related to integrated pest management through our plant-wise program and some of the key principles that we follow when we're looking at communication. Um, so there's six key features around some of the um, communication campaigns um, that we implement. So the first principle is around um, carrying out a situation analysis and formative research which informs how we implement the campaigns, the channels we choose, etc. So it's about understanding the current practices, it's about understanding the incentives and disincentives for practice change. It's looking at the availability of inputs, so are they affordable, are they accessible, where are they accessible, and um, what are the different options, understanding the policy environment and whether there are barriers to change there, and also understanding in detail the communication um, landscape. So what are the preferred sources of um, information for our target audiences and what are the people in the local context that are um, provide potential partnering opportunities. Um, key partners are of course the delivery partners, so some of the people that have been um, talking today, um, people running radio stations or mobile service um, delivery, running video screening um, initiatives, these kinds of things. And knowledge partners, people who have um, the key messages, who have information, 
um, bring across a, across a country that might be the uh, national research, but it might be uh, many others, private sector, etc. Um, the input partners and the the uh, research partners that help us learn so that we continuously improve. So our important part of the process is developing the content, making sure messages are consistent, um, target the audience, um, and are, are presented in appropriate formats. A key approach of our workshops where we, which is a key part of developing the content, are also all about bringing stakeholders together and making sure that we're um, reaching a consensus on the key messages and trying to um, integrate some consistency. At the moment, often you find that there's very many conflicting messages which are introduced into communities. And of course, looking at uh, segmenting audiences, understanding that uh, men and women, young and old, and um, people in rural areas um, and, and, and other areas, they end up have probably different ways of accessing information and they may have different messaging needs. So we talk about hybrid communication, um, and essentially it's about bringing together multiple channels or formats where we're balancing the reach uh, and likelihood of sustained change. I think still um, the evidence suggests that face-to-face -face interactions are more likely to bring sustained change, but they are necessarily limited through reach. So we talk about different kinds of approaches, early warning when there's a new pest coming, when we've been doing a lot of work with that with fall armyworm about how to manage it, new technology, and then more general good agricultural practices across the season. And important in the campaigns is about integrating feedback mechanisms and uh, ongoing learning process so we continuously improve and expand the evidence base. So I wanted to touch on digital solutions. I think you've been talking about some of these already. Obviously, there's a lot of opportunities, and particularly in COVID, there's many people rushing to digital, um, and they undoubtedly improve reach, and they make it much e easier to communicate um, without face-to-face -face interactions. But of course, there are challenges coming up um, through the, through the, with the digital approaches, and I think some probably have been mentioned in earlier pr presentations. Um, in particular, the digital divide, not everybody can afford devices. Um, as so many people are starting to communicate with, uh, with mobile, then regulations are having to be introduced to protect privacy and to protect people even from, uh, to retain their data. The churn rate is very high. Certainly in Africa, we see a big um, churn rate in, the, in mobile numbers. And the, the affordability, of course, can be um, very mixed. In low income countries, it can be a, a huge percentage um, of, a, of a monthly salary, which is needed to purchase a smartphone. Um, even in Asia Pacific, and in particularly in India, the cost is very high. And the data cost across Africa, on average, is the cost of a, a GB of data is 7% of a monthly salary, which is equivalent to a US earner paying $373 um, per gigabyte. So I just wanted to um, just race through a few examples um, in our PlantWise program in, um, in CABI. So one of the, face, the key face-to-face -face interaction is through plant clinics where plant doctors are present um, in a particular place twice a month, normally where farmers can bring any crop and any problem. And in a, a recent randomized control trial, where we've been looking at the effect of this, we find um, increased knowledge scores of our plant doctors. And for farmers within a half, one and a half kilometer radius of where the clinics run, so within the mandate area of the plant doctor that's running the clinic, we see changes in, um, we see changes in behavior in the, the, the practices. And we also saw in this particular case, a 13% higher um, production of maize in the areas where the plant doctors were operating, which led to higher net incomes. And this was in 2017, when of course fall armyworm was, was um, really first being seen in big numbers in Kenya. In Rwanda and Zambia, where there was um, similarly plant clinics, this is for, for farmers actually visiting the plant clinics, we found that they were more likely to use pesticide. This, this often happens as farmers um, tend to come to clinics when the problem is, is bad. Not using pesticide may not be an option, but we see that there are evidence that they're using it more judiciously. 
and the cost per hectare, the number of sprays are similar to the control farmers. And we see an increase in plant in, in um, protective equipment that's used, and um, particularly in, in Rwanda, where the um, initial use of protective equipment was very low. So we talk about um, moving from the advisory services face to face. Um, we collect data at the clinics and that can identify when we're starting to get an outbreak. And then we look at mass reach through using mass media. So a couple of examples here in, in Uganda, we looked at local initiatives and we worked with partners in Radio Farm, Radio International with a, a team screening videos to farmers and uh, um, another SMS service. And we looked at putting out similar messages, consistent messages across these different delivery channels. And we saw a 20% improvement in the knowledge of the farmers that we um, interviewed and we um, and 54% increase in the numbers of practices. So looking at a much broader range of practices consistent with um, an IPM approach. So mixing regular monitoring, um, the hand-picking of lava, these kind of approaches with um, use of chemical pre um, pesticides. And we found an additive effect of different channels. An example, <coughs> excuse me, uh, of a campaign, a recent campaign last year in Kenya was around uh, a focus on using a video in this case, but also working with um, um, a local organization, the Serial Growers Association, who had an existing network of um, lead farmers. So we shared the, the videos with those lead farmers who then shared um, that video in the small groups that they connect with. So that reached 14,000 farmers. We then also put out the, um, the videos in a Facebook campaign uh, where we reached large, much larger numbers of farmers. But interestingly, again, this, this uh, digital divide, we found that they were predominantly um, young men. Um, so it's just as an illustration of that, um, uh, that, that difference. So I, I'm going to stop there. I've, um, there's, um, I, I think the presentations are going to be shared and I added some um, links where you can get more information. Thank you very much. Thank you for, very much, Danny. Can you, I, I'm just going to um, share my screen so that we're ready to go. And then I'm going to uh, ask you some questions. Let me just see if I'm right there. Aha, excellent. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, very interesting. And I really like all those examples where you've actually looked at the, um, I, I guess, the effectiveness of these hybrid type of communication approaches. Um, so really interesting. And I think also, I mean, this has come up a lot, this digital divide, but also just co how context is so um, important to understand who are the farmers that you're communicating to. H how are you trying to address that digital divide? And, and is it just through these variety of different communications or channels or hybrid communications used at the same time? Or are you trying to address how to have more women engaged on uh, with your videos or more women engaged with your or different ages how are you addressing that so i think i mean we're working with various different partners so we have different kinds of approaches in the, the the approaches that we manage so things like um um the the face-to-face -face approaches like the plant clinics and then we kind of make a big effort to try and encourage um, women farmers looking at the timing of, of um, when the clinics run, looking at um, making sure that there are um, male and female plant doctors, um, some of those kinds of those kinds of issues. Um, I think we in some of our partners that we've worked with there and, and we, we we like to work with people who are making um, that kind of of that, that kind of effort. For example, Farm Radio International, um, they look at, they're trying to develop programs that are, are encouraging women, so that are targeting women, um, mm -hmm. these kinds of things. So we do what we can, yeah. Okay, um, and tell me, do these sort of hybrid communication approaches, do they create a lot more work and cost? Um, I think there's there's um, there, there's inevitably a cost, and I think there's um, basically what we're looking at is the trade-offs between different kinds of approaches. So we try and capitalize on um, 
you know, when, when we've got a kind of set of a con set of content and information materials that kind of uh, cuts down the cost because it's been used in many different ways. We're usually leveraging other um, other partners and their different um, different channels. So they also have um, ways which they they uh, aim to keep the costs down. So um, yes, in some ways it does increase costs, but on the other hand, it does increase the um, um, the effect and the outcomes. Mm. Okay, and and I think we talked about this at the very start around the the potential need to reinforce communications across not just the lifetime of the project but even beyond the project if that's relevant. Mm. I mean, do you have you done much work or have you have you seen um, or, or have you done some research and understanding? How important those reinforcement communications are and when they should be done. Um, we, we haven't specifically looked at that. I think we, um, again, there, there's a, there's, there's a trade-off between the, the kind of um, initiative like plant clinics, which are there, mm -hmm. um, the idea is that they're, they're continuously, and some of the campaign work that we've done is around this um, responding to outbreaks and these kind of things. So they're intended to, to um, uh, reach farmers in, in a short period of time. Um, but yes, I mean, I think you you do see this gradual increase in um, in changes in practice over time. But um, no, I wouldn't say we've got specific research around that at the yeah. moment. And um, another question, I guess, related to that was just how long after your campaign, for example, um, do farmers continue to uh, I guess, adopt that behaviour. Have, have you seen how the longevity, I guess, of that behavioural change uh, in practice? I think the, the um, I think inevitably there'll always be an element of farmers trying out practices. And um, um, so we, we have some panel surveys where we've kind of been looking at changes um, over time and I think we, we, we feel that there is consistency they do continue to use um, approaches that that are um, effective um, but and I guess they will continue to do that all the time that they see that they are effective and working yeah and um, thinking about the sort of future I guess of communications and stuff do you see I mean you raised some good points about digital, just around access to digital and the cost. Um, and I think some of our other speakers sort of spoke about this too. I mean, do you think in the future, is everyone going to go to digital? Are we going to see farmers just using digital phones virtually in, in 10 years' time and that's the main way that they'll be communicating? Or will there always be that need for a, a range, I guess, of other kind of communication channels and face-to-face -face contact? I, I think there always will be I, the, the need for a, a mix of channels. I think at the moment, particularly under the situation with COVID, there's a real rush for digital. Um, but I, th I think we're far away in many countries. Again, different countries, are the, the context varies. But I think we're still far away from, um, you know, complete penetration of smart phones and feature phones and we do often when we do first surveys we're looking at farmers preferred sources of information how they prefer to access information and almost always the the preferred sources are are um face-to-face -face interactions with uh, often with the, the um extension staff um mm -hmm. and kinds of things so i don't i don't think that, that will go away i think it's going to be always really in, in, important to use that mix yeah, exactly. That's, that's great feedback. But And there's one more thing that I think would be interesting to ask you. I think in our very first speaker, we were talking about lead farmers, I mean, their usefulness and, and potentially reaching out to them and using them in communications, but also the importance of reaching out to those farmers that aren't lead farmers and that actually some of the communication and, and change was through reaching out to those farmers and getting them to be part of that change communication change process i mean have you found that as well because often we're drawn to lead farmers and we're always looking for the lead farmer to model the behavior but are we sometimes ignoring maybe some of those other farmers that are probably maybe more alike the bulk of the farmers 
I think I think the way that we've um, kind of seen lead farmers is is usually as an entry point for working with other farmers. So yeah. I think the example in the Cereal, Cereal Growers Association, they have a network of lead farmers, but the role of those lead farmers is to, is to engage with other farmers in their community. So I think you 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 do find that they're um, again when you look at, at the most common the most common sources of information is often neighbors and fellow farmers family members so i think the the um i think again there needs to be a mix, a, a mix. i think some of the approaches such as radio um has a broader reach probably than than um approaches that that are channeled through phones where where men and often young men tend to control the the devices um, but I think it's looking at, at a mix of it. One when, when we've had um, um, when we were sharing some WhatsApp videos with um, with with numbers that we would collected in in screenings, um, and a woman had given the number. Often they get, they give the number of their sons um, or their or their uh, husbands, and um, in in some SMS work with, that we did in in Tanzania. Certainly, when we started working with a group. It, we needed to go through those lead farmers because the the other farmers were a little bit suspicious and concerned about sharing their numbers. So yeah. it was really about working with communities to capitalise on the on on the role of um, of, of certain individuals within a community. Great, excellent. Thank you, Danny. Thank you so much for joining us in the middle of the night, um, middle of the morning from from England. We really appreciate having you here, um, and it's really great to see the the type of work that you're doing. Uh, and really giving us some examples there of the success um, of different approaches and these hybrid approaches. So thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so now I'm just gonna move on to a very quick summary um, and I haven't definitely not uh, included everything here um, and I can't do full justice to all the presentations, but I would like to thank all the excellent speakers today. We've had five, it's been a very uh, quick, uh, session really fast paced, but huge amount of information. Um, we've had plenty of insight into how social networks can be powerful ways of communicating information and changing behavior. We've heard also again across all our speakers how people will learn from others who are similar to them, especially um, we had some great examples from Jalsi and Siddharth who both demonstrated this with uh, video, for example, and YouTube. Gender, language, household type, educational levels also need careful consideration when communicating. Think of incentives. Roshi mentioned a certificate at the end of the course, for example, and also access to seeds or tools for those that finished or completed the, uh, the course, which is always sometimes a useful way of getting people to, to finish what they've started. Danny left us with the importance of considering hybrid tactics to communicate um, and reach out to different learning styles, but also to reinforce messages amongst farmer groups. Um, and I think that importance of reinforcing messages in the future could be <laughs> useful to extend the longevity of behavioral change. Um, I also think um, there was a few really nice sort of statements uh, at the start around how multiple sources really need to be used to reach out to farmers uh, and experimentation is important i really liked that because i think it's really important to try new ways um, new ways of communicating these hybrid communication styles understanding your context and and really working out what works for each community uh, you need to take the time to put the farmers first and understand what their needs are so plenty to talk about. Uh, I will be sending out all the presentations and the video recordings uh, to you all. I hope that you can join us for our next session on the 7th of September where we're looking at, we, we are looking at the behaviour of pesticide purchasing and use, which will be another really interesting session. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, we really appreciate your input and your participation in this series. Thank you once again to the speakers, to Whaley who's been helping, uh, and also Putra who's also been helping in the background. Thank you very much. Uh, have a safe and happy day. Bye. Uh, if you have time to answer a questionnaire, in, oh, I shall put one on. Just before you go. Thank you everyone.